for the RV. Okay, so uh, good day everyone and good morning, Eric. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to our, on our second webinar about software testing. And today my uh, guest is Eric Pregler, my friend, and uh, so president of a session for software testing. And uh, before we proceed any further, I would like to uh, remind you that you will have the opportunity to address your questions to our speaker at the end of the webinar. And uh, during our webinar, you can address your questions in Slido, Zoom, and in Facebook. And at the end, we'll start reading your questions. So, uh, Eric, I'd like to thank you for accepting my invitations. Uh, this invitation, and many people remember you were doing a talk at the Yerevan uh, Testing Days conference, and also you were a panelist during our conference. And it was a pleasure for us to host you in Yerevan. I'd like to remind you guys that you can join Association for Software Testing Army. Just need uh, to ping me, and we'll organize your joining our association and now i would like to pass me to eric good morning eric and first questions and first of all i would like uh, to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came into the software testing world okay uh so um as uh, uh, ram introduced me i'm eric i'm eric Kregler. uh i'm a, a staff software engineer for a company called credit karma uh, based here in San Francisco. Uh, I know Ram from being the uh, president of the Association for Software Testing and, and uh, coming to uh, Yerevan Testing Days uh, 2019, which was a wonderful, wonderful visit. I was very glad to, um, to come to Armenia and meet many great testers. Uh, so that was that was really that was really wonderful. I can't wait to come back again some at some someday if, if Ram will have me. For sure, it will happen very soon. So um, I got, I became a software, I started out as a software developer and uh, I was working on a uh, software program to keep track of immunizations for children and the business logic for uh, which immunizations children had had was a very interesting testing problem. And that's when I realized that I was enjoying a lot more um, the process of coming up with uh, with tests for the code I was writing than I was actually writing the code. So I've been dedicated to software testing for uh, a little over 20 years now. So 20 years, uh, huge, huge, very huge experience. And I think you'll have a lot more to tell us about your experience. So uh, now you are a context driven staff test engineer. So it's very interesting. And can you tell us about your role and a little bit about your position? So uh, what you are doing as a context driven staff test engineer? Sure. Uh so uh, the job I had before this one, I was uh, my title was a senior director of testing, which means I had a number of people that uh, I was managing and managers that I was managing. Um, and what happened is I, I kind of lost touch with the work and I was turning into the kind of manager who has opinions about things he did, that they don't really understand. Um, that I may be repeating myself. So I thought that for my next job, I would want to uh, do the testing work again. Uh, part of that was because it wasn't much fun to be a manager in a place with a great deal of pressure to get things done. Uh, and part of that was I just really liked testing. So the 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 um, in in the U.S. a title like a staff or an architect um, basically is somebody who's a senior enough person to know the field well, but that you don't trust to be in charge of people. So that's just a little, a little a joke. Um, but staff engineers are typically 
um, given some leeway to decide which projects to work on uh, and you know, to advise and to, to coach and then you know help with planning uh, you know help with test, with test execution I still get to do a lot of testing but um, I spent a great deal of time working on test strategy uh, how will we test certain things um, talking with engineers about making things testable talking with executives about uh, you know, our challenges in our testing and how things could be better. Um, so in some ways it's a, uh, some ways it's, some ways it's, it's, it's a great job because uh, I, I, I get a lot of variety for it. Um, but I think I've still maybe, uh, I don't always get as much depth as I'd like. And it starts in terms of really learning how a piece of software works and being the person who knows more about it than anyone else in the world which is what I think a really good software tester who's gotten to know the software that they're testing, that's where they'll end up. Great, so uh, you mentioned uh, very cool things for me. So uh, one of them that making things testable. So uh, how you are helping the team to make something testable and uh, how you are achieving this goal? Because in many companies, it's very difficult to achieve uh, to have something testable for testers. So testers can test and can give some information about the product. Many engineers, many managers are saying, okay, it's uh, already developed, so you can test it, but it's not testable. How oh, you are talking with them, how oh, you are telling them to make something testable. Well, there's some there's some pretty simple answers for uh, test automation when you talk about making something testable, where uh, you know objects on a web page have a meaningful name, or um, you can uh, update a JavaScript variable in a web page when you finish loading something. And that's that, that there's that one concept of making things testable, uh, where you're you understand you, you, it's 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 easy to observe the system that you're testing and understand what it's doing. And when it's test automation, then it's the, it's the it, there might be uh, small examples like the, the field name. But when you're the, the, in the larger sense, this, this uh, tends to be things like log files. Um, understand if there's a, if there's a pro, if there's a problem, or even if there isn't, can you reconstruct what the software actually did? Um, it, are the, the intermediate states, if software, uh, transforms data three times, can you check on it at each state and understand which happened to it um, as it as, you know, as it moved along? The kind of testing where something has a black box and you you click something and then you, you, you look at what comes out the other end and you hope it works, uh, that's a, not a very testable system. I think of um, testing as learning something about a system, testing as uh, finding ways to stimulate it with uh, the conditions, the data that you expose it to, and then learn what it does. And if you get really good at predicting what the system will, does, and, and it, um, then you're you know the system very well. And if it usually if it, if it almost always gives you what you're looking for, then the system is probably of decent quality. Um, if you are still learning things about the software, then uh, there's a lot of testing work left to do. Yeah, and uh, you also talked about the test of uh, role that has of know more about the products uh, than the other ones. So uh, as testers, we need to give some information uh, about the product to the stakeholders and to those people who are interested in the quality and in the status of the Product. So, uh, what are your thoughts about this? How to achieve this goal to give this information and how to learn more about the product? So, what's the way, best way, or make real testing? Okay, um, I'd say that uh, in terms of giving the information, um, that's a testing skill where uh, you, sh you should be able to do a quick, concise, test report at any one time um, that's meaningful to the person that you're giving it to. Now, what I would report is going to change a lot as I learn more about the software that I'm testing. Um, so if, if I think I would start with that about how much can I learn about the software 
because the longer I the longer I have to spend with the software, the more meaningful my report will be, the more confident I will be in the in the um, analysis that I do of that software. So I try to um, I try to learn uh, learn learn about the software as quickly as I can, and the 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 number one uh, strategy for that is to stop doing confirmatory testing. Um, proving that the software does what it's supposed to do, people uh, a lot of people believe that's what testing's for. I think that's the most boring part of testing. Um, I think when you find when you find software doing something it isn't supposed to be doing. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, it's a bug. That test case fails. Well, the, the way that I think about this is if I can, if I can find uh, if I can find a way for software to misbehave, I'm identifying a symptom. The, 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 the test case that's failing is an artifact of how I'm modeling that software. My test case is a thing I think the software should be doing. And when I say it passes or fails, I'm saying, does it do what I expected or not? So if I can find things that the software does that are that are unexpected, then that means I've got, it's like finding somebody who has a temperature. Perhaps they have uh, an infection. If somebody says my you know oh, my wrist hurts, maybe that, maybe there's a sprain. Maybe there's another problem. Um, so I, I think that uh, software barely works at all, and people know very little about it, including the people who are writing it. Uh, so for a tester to uh, get away from, you know, X plus Y equals Z check and get into, okay, well, what happens when I do this? And what happens when I do that? And what happens if, the, if, if we do this? And what, what occurs with this kind of data? I think that that's, that's how the tester quickly learns more than anybody else, because everyone else is staying on the path, or I call the happy path, where if, if nothing challenging or unexpected happens, the software continues to work. Great, great. Very little software gets to live that way its whole life. So by getting getting away from happy paths by challenging software with uh, with inputs and um, requests that the people who design the software had uh, not thought through and helpfully written out for you to tell you what to test, then you're, that's how you become an expert. You have to remember that whatever a developer can tell you about uh, what they think you need to test. They might give you some insight, but they've also, you know, they're also limited by what they can imagine. And if they could imagine the, thing, the, the problems that you could find, then what do they need you for? That's what you're, the value that you're there to add is to think about ways to test software differently uh, than just the simple, this is what we expected and it does exactly that under exactly these conditions. Questions and uh, everything. So, speaking about uh, developers, how, what's your think uh, what should be the best or the good relationship between and friendship or how it's called? So, relationship between the software tester and the development team. So, uh, developer, uh, the product manager, product owner, author, etc. So, uh, what should be the best or the good? Uh, relationship there. Um, so the relationship, the relationship that they should have is one where we're collaborating together. Uh, we value the the, the uh, contributions of everyone on the team. We all have the same goals. That's what should be. Unfortunately, um, testers uh, may not have may, may not have an equal seat at the table in certain circumstances. Um, it's not very often uh, that uh, that engineers are asked to, well, can't you just do it in half the time? That's the kind of thing that a tester is asked to do. Um, most people don't think they can write code, but lots of people think they can test. For some definition of testing, that may be true. Um, so I think that the, rela the, the, rela the, the kind of relationship that I look for with the engineers that I work with is uh, to build some trust that I won't try to make them look bad. I won't try to, um, I won't try to expose any of their misdeeds or anything. I'm trying to help protect them by making their work as of high quality as possible. 
Um, and so I think that that, that that works as a group dynamic where we're trying to, we want to be proud of our work. We want to all be happy with what we've done. And, um, I think that, that, that works the, as the group dynamic while you're living through it. And I think, it, I think that's what the, the better quality at the end comes from people who approach the problem that way. Um, and I think that's a bit of my manager experience coming in, that you can't really motivate people with fear. You, can't, um, you can motivate them for in the short term with money, and then they want more money. What actually motivates people is doing a good job. And if people feel like they're being effective, if people feel are proud of the work that they're doing, that's what truly motivates them. So the trick is to uh, have a circumstance where we, where we understand what we're working on, we understand what the goals are, and we try to achieve it together. So definitely we'll, we'll um, make friends with the developer, uh, try to conspire with them, try to feel that I'm, uh, try, try, try to uh, help him or her feel that I've got their back. So um, one of the tricks that I use for that is to be uh, pushed back on the schedule loudly so that the engineer doesn't have to. And try to, you know, and, and the, 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 um, the engineers I work with often know that the schedule is ridiculous but they're not, they're not, they're not, they don't think it's productive to argue because, you know, they'll be done when they're done. But if they can hear me saying things that they wish they were saying or would like to have said, then that can help. Um, now, for the stakeholders, the people who consume, um, so, who consume some of my work, I mean, some of my testing work is back to the engineer. Here's what I found. Here's what I've thought of. What do you think? Um, you know, that, 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 that's, what, that's one dynamic. The other dynamic is, um, if I talk to a product owner and I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to understand better their requirements, or I'm trying to uh, negotiate, hey, um, so this software does this, is that acceptable, or do we need additional documentation? And what I find is the most effective on that side is to uh, be to be very very clear, you know, a couple paragraphs in my test report not go into the details of something um, when my, the first time I answer a question, you know, make them ask me if they, if they really want to know, uh, you know, the intricacies of a thing and just kind of focus on um, as somebody who uh, is impatient to have the software and, and, and needs it to solve the business problem. What can I tell them that's helpful? And if and it, their so software will go out that I don't think is done. Software will go out that I don't think is good enough. Um, but I can't just say it's not good enough. I have to say, I think this and this could be better. And if I had more time, I would do this and this to learn more about the software and be very explicit in what's the trade what the trade off actually is. Um, I think we, you know, we all know instinctually when there isn't enough time or um, the corners are being uh, cut too closely, but being able to explain what the actual cost is, you know, this is the risk that we're, that we're taking on if we don't do this kind of testing. Um, this late change uh, for a bug fix, no, we really do need to test this much because if we don't, we risk these areas of the software not working. So yeah, that's that's those are the, those are the those are the ways I try to fit into a team. Okay, so, uh, how you to uh, what's your definition of software testing? Definition of which testing? Definition of software testing. How are you to define? Oh, definition of software testing. Mm. So I think that I think that the thing I said before that I probably feel fits the best would um, I think software testing is a process of um, modeling what the software uh, how, mod modeling what the software is supposed to do, and then separately modeling how the software actually works, um, exposing this you know having having uh, hypotheses about how the software will. Um, that will work and then uh, exposing it to different inputs and seeing what actually happens and keeping good records of the same. I think that's probably the biggest gap in how people approach testing software that I have a strong opinion about. Um, when I started in software testing, the most common way people approach things were with a specification 
and a long list of things that were designed to assess whether the software did what it was we what it was we thought it was supposed to do before we ever wrote any code. Um, I, that never that never worked for me. What I found was is that I need to engage with what the software actually was. You know, whatever we thought we were going to write, this is what we have. Being able to uh, understand that and explain what it is that we have is is more useful in a business context than pointing at some specification doc somebody wrote two years ago. What's helpful to the business is, is if you put this in front of a customer tomorrow, this is what it's going to do. So I think that um, I think that 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 modeling and description and experimentation I think those are the three pillars of software testing to me. Great information. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, so we are we're kind of like with context driven testing. And context driven testing has seven principles. So which one is your favorite and why that one is your favorite? If you have <laughs> Well, let me see. Um, of the set, of, of the set, I know there are seven, and I couldn't remember. I couldn't write them all out right now. Um, the one when I was younger, the one that made the more made the most sense to me was is that uh, there are no best practices; there are only good practices in context. Uh, and that, to me, was that seemed like the blind spot that the whole world that, that seemed it had that. All software projects should be run the same way with the same terminologies and the same activities. And they would all, you know, if you would merely apply this process properly, you would get the right result. Um, context driven testing was the first time I saw somebody really in an articulate way reject that and point out that every single software project is unique. Um, and it, it, it is really, uh, we have all of this uh, rhetoric uh, and terminology and software that come, especially in quality, that comes from like a manufacturing context or talks about uh, defects as if this were something that comes in because like our, I don't know, our milling machine leaves a burr on a product. And it, 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 every piece of software that gets, that gets made is actually more like a movie or a novel or uh, uh, yeah, perhaps a, a magazine issue if it's something that the the group is familiar with, it's still a creative exercise. It's still starting with nothing and ending up with something um, through, you know, through stuff coming out of people's brains. You know, a, a code editor is blank when it gets started. So that was, that was my favorite for a long time. Um, as I got older, I realized, uh, I realized how uh, powerful the idea was that the, um, the product solves a pro the, um, the product is intended to solve a problem. If it doesn't solve the problem, and I, I, th I think I'm mangling the quote a little bit, but essentially uh, the fitness for purpose of the software is really what quality is about. Like if, if it has bugs, like I have, an, I, I have a, a personal relationship with quality because I spend so much time testing where if I see a lot of bugs, I, I don't like the software. I don't think it works well. But there's some pretty terrible software out there that solves problems and that people are quite comfortable with. And I think it was um, having a few years of my career of, you know, seeing people use software that I thought really sucked and see them use all day, every day and tell me how much they depended on it. That helped me kind of come to that realization that, um, you know, everything that we look at in terms of bugs or is this too many clicks? Is this a bad usability experience? Uh, what kind of, how do I log my errors? All of these things and, um, are, uh, end up a part of the part of, do the people that use the software, uh, does it solve their problem or not? So, uh, I think I ask much better questions to product owners these days when I, when I, and when I talk about fitness for purpose, um, which, and which is a different discussion than does it have bugs or do test cases fail? Yeah. Uh, so speaking about bugs, do you like finding bugs? Say, can you say it again? Uh, do you like finding bugs? 
usually I like finding bugs. Um, I like finding bugs because it, it, it is a reward for the work. You know, the, uh, the pig who finds the truffle is pretty pleased, right? Yeah. Um, there are times though, when I'm trying to get work done where I find that bugs can be a distraction. Um, and usually, you know, it's not a, it's not an issue of, you know, like I, I was complaining about comparing software to, to a factory. You know, if I were actually, if I was a QA person, if I was actually assuring quality, instead of collecting information about quality, if I was assuring quality in a factory, I would pick up a part and I would, uh, I would do whatever test it is. Maybe I would measure it or I would weigh it or something. Oh, doesn't fit. I throw it aside. A software bug is uh, seeing something I did not expect is usually the start of an investigation, which could take anywhere from five minutes to five days, depending on where it leads. Um, so when it's something juicy that I feel like I've found a way where um, data has been transformed in a way we didn't expect, or there's some risk, some significant risk to value that the team really needs to know about, that's motivating for me because I can help my team. Um, when I, sometimes I do get annoyed when it's, when it's uh, bugs that seem trivial. Oh, like, oh great, this browser that 0.1% what, that of our users use uh, under these conditions has this problem. Oh, I can't wait to set up that stupid edge browser and go poke around in this area for 20 minutes at least until I feel like I understand the issue and then write it up so no one will fix it. Like that's not so motivating. And uh, how do you feel when you are not a software tester of that product and you are using some application and you are finding bugs, how do you feel that? Uh, so I used to be, I, uh, one of those testers who would grumble and go, you know, what is with this? What's with this crappy piece of software? Did, and, and then um, uh, as I as I got more experience and I realized how many bugs the project I was working on decided to ship with, I got a little kinder. And then eventually I came around to the side where um, uh, the way I think about problems now um, is different than way different than than, than when I started. Uh, so I think there are people who will see one software bug and go, this software sucks. Um, I'm super disappointed when they're software testers and they, or, or then they, they behave that way. Uh, what I've learned is that most people are working under pressure. They're doing the best they can for the circumstances that they're in and um, mistakes are inevitable. And by the way, any bug I I find may be well understood by the people who wrote the software and they may have decided to ship it anyway, based on the, based on the, uh, I don't know, anything from a executive's bonus package to we have to release the software or we're going to lose the company to, I just want to be done. I want to go to my kids football practice. And these are this, you know, we're, we're people who are, uh, who are, who are fallible. We're doing our best. We're all doing our best. Uh, not, no one's perfect. Um, so I, I guess I feel sympathy. Um, there's a saying in the uh, SRE space, you know, the systems reliable engineering space. Um, somebody will, so, you know, there'll be some high profile uh, outage, like a GitHub. And people say hashtag hug ops, because they want to go give a hug to the people who right now are panicking about the system that's not working, that everyone's blaming them for it not working. You know, the these this, this, these are complicated things that we work on. Um, it's amazing that they work at all, especially you know if you've been testing for a while and you see what what constitutes uh, working software. Um, and uh, when 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 you're analyzing a problem, um, any yeah, I don't even like to use the word root cause analysis because root cause analysis is usually just who's the person I can blame, who which person made the mistake that they need to not make in the future is not a useful way to approach those problems. Um, a useful way to approach those problems is what are the circumstances under which this error occurred and human error could be part of it, but 
people are part of a system, part of a complicated system that has very imperfect measurements. It has uh, not everyone who works on the system has the same framing. I mean, it's kind of amazing that anything works. Um, okay, uh, now let's speak a little bit about uh, performance and reliability testing. So, uh, oh, great, okay. cool. Yeah, so <laughs> I know that that's the best part for you. So uh, I know that you had uh, many uh, talks during large conferences about it. So can you share uh, what's performance testing and what is reliability testing, and what are the most important things in performance testing and reliability testing? Okay, well, I'll, try, I'll, I'll time box myself here. Okay. I, can, I can go on for a while. Um, yeah. So I specialized in performance uh, testing for a number of years. Um, so, so to me, I think of performance testing, uh, there's uh, measuring uh, measuring the responsiveness of software, sometimes with load, but not always. Um, most people, when they think of performance testing, they're thinking of load testing where they simulate uh, some number of, of users uh, concurrently accessing a system so that they can learn something about how the software scales under load and how it responds under load. Um, it's another thing a bit like the rest of software testing where people who don't do it feel like they have a handle on it. So I'll try to go through like three big things that you might not know about performance testing if you haven't done it. Um, the first one is that you really can't create a performance test that's anything like what's gonna happen in production. If it's, it can be similar to, but, um, this the you know performance testing tools are crappy automation tools it's difficult to have to, to to have all of the activities that are occurring in a system at any one time for performance testing you choose a really crude hammer here's the six things people do in the system with a limited set spread of data that will they'll do in a very mechanical repeated way and that is nothing like what production is so the I, the, the concept that i will apply the same load in a performance test and it will be that that production will have and it will be totally predictive of what happens that's the first thing people get wrong the second thing that people get wrong is they think that load is strictly about the number of people who are using a system at any one time now there are aspects of load that are like that like the uh the java memory heap of the server that's keeping track of your sessions. That indeed grows based on the number of users that are logged on. But if you're actually looking at um, things like response time and how the system is responding, um, a more meaningful measurement would be the number of activities in a certain amount of time. Uh, by that, I would say, if somebody says, I would like you to performance test this system that uh, prints invoices every time somebody orders something i would say okay well how many invoices does it print per hour that's the more important question than how many people actually use the system at any one time because that activity measurement matters more than some arbitrary thing about the number of users that you're simulating which is the measurement that tool vendors came up with to figure out how much to sell you the third thing um, is in that example of you know, that example that I was just providing, somebody said, well, it's really important that we simulate 500 users. I would say, okay, um, do they arrive at the same time? And, and what, what, the reason why I bring that up is that uh, the arrival rate of load uh, is, is, is probably more important than the overall volume. Users uh, log onto a system and they can take, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be there for a few to many minutes or hours. Um, if the, everybody logs on it at 9 a.m., the system can go down with a, with a fairly small number of, a fairly small amount of load applied. I worked on systems that could support thousands of concurrent users that I could 
that I could wipe out with 100 users logging on at the same time. So I think those are probably the the thing the those are the things I think most people don't know about performance testing. And I better oh okay. Um, I want to say one more thing about performance testing. Um, it's this was a it was a very important discipline when we were first building multi-user systems and websites. Um, over time, as distributed systems have gotten pretty complicated and have a lot of different components, and uh, yeah, the, the the idea that I'll run uh, 100 different microservices to provide a website, it becomes far more difficult to do performance testing the way we used to. At the same time, monitoring tools have gotten so much better. Um, tools like New Relic or, uh, or Dynatrace, they're, they're called uh, APM tools, uh, really kind of flip things over to where uh, if you work on a commercial website, it ends up being uh, more cost effective to share 1% of your traffic with some kind of code and just measure how it actually performs than it was to go through this elaborate process of running a complicated load model that may or may not be predictive and deciding based on that how to release things. I mean, if testing is to learn about your system, the most effective way to learn about the performance characteristics of a system is to observe it actually working as opposed to in some lab that it, where it's not at all like, like production and it's not doing what production does. So the discipline of performance these days has changed quite a lot because of, uh, because of our ability to see how things actually perform and be able to measure them closely. Uh, and it's faster to change things. We're now releasing software like uh, pretty regularly. Um, if in a, in a true continuous delivery shop where you're pushing several builds of software a day, it's a very different deal than when we were releasing once a year and we would need to do load testing before we released. I better stop there. That's like five minutes of perf. <laughs> yeah, and uh, two last questions uh, from me. So uh, many testers now are willing to learn performance testing. What uh, would you suggest to them? I think that there are a few different ways you can approach it and that you, um, how, what you learn about testing um, shouldn't be based on one person's idea of what a curriculum should be. Uh, uh, me personally, I think I'm, um, I think I'm a very technical tester, but not necessarily a great test automator. So I like reading about architecture. I like reading about systems. Um, I, I try to stay up to date on like uh, you know, the, the latest things that are happening in container management and things like that, because that affects my testing when I think about the stuff that I'm approaching. Um, so that I read a lot of stuff that's uh, maybe designed in that area. Um, I think there are testers who love test automation and they want to be test automators. And that's the thing that they really want to do. So that's easy. I just say um, you should go to uh, the Apple Tools Test Automation U site that my friend Angie Jones has put up and go do all those courses. Um, there are people who uh, people who focus on the you know, social aspects of software testing, uh, which you know, is a big part of it. You know, of one person's idea, uh, one person's idea of what software should do is based on usage and capability. And another person's idea is based uh, is based on looking at the code, looking outwards. Um, being able to reconcile those is uh, is like a social scientist skill or even an anthropologist skill. Um, I think that no, I, I think that any kind of tester is going to do well with thinking about experiment design um, and what uh, what James Bach and Michael Bolton call uh, uh, started labeling as a epistemology when I first got interested in testing, which is basically a, uh, like a philosophy of science. Uh, how do I know what I know? How sure am I that I know what I know? Where could I be wrong? And really like examining the assumptions that we make. You know, um, there are a lot of times in our testing where um, under the best conditions things work and from that we conclude we're ready to risk, our, risk this company's reputation on the software. Well, are you sure? What do you actually know about the software? 
what might you not know? How might you learn? Um, that kind of, you know, that kind of studying the process of software testing and uh, learning to be humble about what you know and don't know or, or how you might be uh, even being deceived by the software you're working on serves all testers. And my last question is my favorite one. It's about books. So uh, what are your favorite books about software testing that would you like to suggest to other software testers? Uh, I think these are pretty, these are, um, I think these are pretty well known, but my, my top two books, it's an easy answer. Um, there's Lessons Learned in Software uh, by uh, James Bach and Brett Pedicord and Kim Kaner. And uh, I, think it, I think it's the thing, when is the fourth author of that book? It came out in the mid 2000s. That's the, the best book about software testing I thought I'd ever read. Um, and then Perfect Software and Other Illusions by Gerald Weinberg. Um, Gerald Weinberg, is, uh, if you don't know who he is, um, he is probably the founder of the field of software testing in some respects. Um, he was testing in NASA projects in 1960 uh, here in the US um, and you know, is pretty much kind of like a godfather of the kind of testing that I like. Um, he passed away just a couple of years ago, um, which, you know, is, which if, you, if you knew him, you, you had a, he had a very full life and that's okay. Um, it's also interesting to take from that, that the people who, have, who first started doing this are still mostly around. This is a very young discipline. There's so much more to be learned and to be said, and it, um, it will the field will continue to change pretty rapidly. You know, we're not talking about something like history that's had centuries to figure out what good practices are and how people go about things. And by the way, it's still pretty dynamic and has things changing. You know, the field of chemistry think, has figured out many things, and you know they're working away at the margins to learn more. And I'm sure there's there's lots more. But we're just getting started with software and software testing. We know so little. Um, and everything that we're trying, no matter how certain somebody is when they tell you this is the right way to do things, um, here's your multiple choice test, make sure you know the right way to do things, it's one person's model. Um, they're, 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 they haven't solved testing and no one will, no one will anytime soon. Thanks a lot, Eric. And now, if you have any questions, you can type them in the Zoom group chat or in Facebook Live. And we'll answer. And yeah, uh, here we have two questions in Slido. So, uh, first question okay. is what kind of metrics can be used to measure performance testing and how to analyze performance testing results? Okay, um, I think that the metric that matters the most in doing performance testing is the user's response time. How long does a person wait until they can do the work that they want to do? Uh, and that's a pretty that's a pretty complicated metric because uh, a, a metric implies some sort of universal application. Like this, this, this. What from here to that far away? is always one kilometer. You know, that's a, that's a measurement, that's a metric. Um, I've worked with people who found two seconds of response time to be way too long and it needs to get better. I've worked with people who are willing to wait 30 seconds. It, it, so it's very contextual, like what that is. Um, the other thing I would say about um, response time is most load tools, <coughs> excuse me one moment. Most load tools um, measure the return of bits, meaning at what point you receive a response from an endpoint. Well, if you look at, if you, if you open up developer tools in, in, you know, in Chrome and look at how a web page is really drawn, that response time from a server uh, used to be uh, the thing that we wanted to measure. Well, it turns out that the, the response time from the server is actually a very small portion of how long a person has to wait until their web page is ready to do something for them. 
that uh, it, tur it turns out that most modern web pages spend more time processing JavaScript than they do getting data from a server. Um, and then as far as, you know, beyond that with metrics, there's a lot of stuff that has to do with um, the, 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 the uh, set of services and servers that you're testing that can get really fun to geek out on, like uh, IO latencies on a database server to see if a database server is backing up or um, remaining CPU on a server to see how much more capacity it has or uh, garbage collection pet no, 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 sorry let's go on. okay thanks a lot so <laughs> and another question uh, so what is your vision about implementation of artificial intelligence in software testing Please share your thoughts about benefits and disadvantages. Benefits and disappointments of software testing? Uh, about implementation of artificial in intelligence in software testing. If, okay, I'm, I apologize. Um, I think it's my headset. Implementation of which in software Art testing? PI. Yeah. Artificial, artificial, oh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's what I think about artificial intelligence. Um, uh, we'd, I'd like to see more natural intelligence. Um, that what most people call AI is really uh, a kind of machine learning. Um, what and that kind of machine learning is usually not very sophisticated. Uh, there are people who are using who are borrowing terms to explain things like, I run some freshman level statistics on something or I run high school level algebra on something. And then that, but that's data science. And then the software that, that, that I, where I store these simple, these fairly simple equations in that I run against a known good, perfectly clean data set and get some results out of, we call the, that artificial intelligence. And it's just, that's just not an accurate way to call it. Um, I think that tool that you know they're 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 interesting tools. They're valuable for doing certain kinds of analysis. Um, I think that uh, the people who want to make money from them um, will say, "Hey, my tool solves all of these problems for you." Um, when what they they well, I think what they mean to say is a skilled person using my tool can be efficiently solve problems like this. Uh, so, I, so um, anything where we believe it, w um, we don't need to think about it, or that something is just handled for us, uh, I think works against good software testing. Um, I think that software testing requires some deep analysis and some and some and some thought. But you know, pattern recognition systems maybe that's a good <laughs> substitute for AI and testing. Uh, are, are really useful. Like I, I do that a lot where if I look at a data set and I try to find anomalies, I try to find things that fit and that don't fit. Cool, those are great. Which test is the flakiest that needs to be refactored? I mean, let me sell you a piece of AI software that will tell you which of your tests are the most effective. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's uh, very <laughs> so um, uh, trending topic. I think this uh, uh, AI implementation, and so uh, I agree with you that uh, many people are trying to build some money on this. And so uh, there are some good tools that uh, can give you a little bit uh, information about this. Uh, yeah, and I. For testing the most in the last three years. Okay, you broke up a little bit, but what was the most interesting thing in software testing the last three years? Now, uh, which recent technology changed the goals and methods uh, of software testing the, uh, the most in the last three years?
So I think it and takes longer than three. It takes longer than three years for something to appear and then appreciate its full effects. I think that there are some there, but I do think that there's a level that's been achieved in observability and, tra and, and tracing in the last couple of years that we don't fully appreciate and testing yet. Um, so uh, observability was a, is a, um, a name for some practices for uh, how does your software actually work in production? How does your, when your software executes, what happened? And one definition of observability that I've heard is data that's been collected from production that lets you ask a question in the future that you haven't formulated yet today. And that's the difference between, say, logging, where you have to decide what you're going to log and why you're going to log it. Um, so the tool that I'm thinking of when I talk about that is called honeycomb.io. A former Facebook engineer wrote, uh, is the CTO for that company. Her name is Charity Majors. We had her as our keynote speaker at the uh, Association for Ta Software Testing's conference last year. So I, the idea that um, I could go look at my software running and understand what was happening at a very, uh, at a very sophisticated level that I could reconstruct, how, you know, what, what variables did the software have when it decided that it would show the user this and what did it show the user in this, this very complex model. Uh, I think that that's, uh, I think that that's a step forward. And I said tracing, cause that's one kind of tracing. And I'm also thinking of a tool called Zipkin. Uh, it's probably been around for longer than three years, but I've seen more people invest in this concept of um, tracing dependencies. Uh, and trying to understand um, how systems work together. But now that we have these these fairly comp complex distributed systems where you might have, by the time all the different microservices have responded to make a thing happen, you might have dozens of data points. And modeling that is a very difficult problem. Uh, one thing I've been working on lately is trying to figure out how to take that sort of traceability of understanding if all of these dozens of services are responding to this request um, and turn that into some sort of uh, reference for testing, where if I need to test something, which parts do I need to test? Which parts can I set aside? Uh, because I, I do have some testing problems like that today that kind of bum me out. Like, hey, we changed this thing. We need some regression testing. Okay, well, what's the scope of that testing? I mean, just regression. Oh, do you, you mean you want me, like, I don't want to, that, that sounds like you want me to test everything. Yeah, yeah, you should test everything. Okay, but that takes a long time and you only change one thing. I don't know if I need to change everything. Well, I don't know if you need, if, I, don't, I, I don't know if I need to test everything. Well, I don't know if you need to test everything either, but I want you to test everything because I don't know. And that, that's a pretty common pattern there. Uh, I have some hope that with uh, even better insight into how software actually works and who it talks to, because the developers actually don't know. Like I did this thing, the right thing showed up and it looks good to me, ship it. That with, with this deeper understanding that we will be able to model what we're testing better, plan our testing better um, and responding to the things that are happening. So, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, also, our webinar is coming to the end. And I'd like to say one more time, thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for uh, all the all your thoughts that you shared with us. And we really hope to see you very soon in Yerevan. And we'll be waiting for you here. And maybe uh, we'll do another uh, webinar before uh, you'll come here too. Uh, I can't wait to come there. And I guess a webinar is better than not coming at all. I really appreciate you having me and, and uh, letting me talk for a while. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So thank you and uh, dear software testers. So see you next week. And next week we will have another webinar and we will share our thoughts about software testing. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you. So nice to talk to you, Ron. Hope to see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. So, bye.